everybody. Well, I'm actually here to welcome Stefano Tonki, who is the editor-in-chief of W Magazine, has been since March 2010. Um, under his leadership at W, they have achieved many accolades, including having been finalists for seven ASME awards, which are very prestigious in the world of publication. They won an ASME in 2013 for photography. I'm sure, as all of you know, W is most well known for their really phenomenal ability to tell stories through their photos. They have received nine Society of Publication Designer medals, and they won a Webby Award for an amazing series they run called Screen Tests, which we're gonna show you in a little bit in 2012. Um, previous to his work at W Magazine, he was the editor for the Time Style section and actually created T Magazine in 2004. Um, so let's welcome Stefano to the stage. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you for joining me and uh, thank Leandra for being such a great host. <laughs> um, before I even like getting to know each other, that is, I think, what these kind of uh, conversations are about, I want to show a, a video, something that uh, um, I think tells a lot about what I like, and I think it's a good uh, starting point uh, for our com conversation. Leandra told you about the screen test, these uh, kind of interviews without uh, actually the voice uh, of the person asking the questions. Um, and uh, there is one of them, one that we did uh, for uh, our cover with Cava de la Vigne, that I think tells really a lot about what W Magazine is today. So let's um, watch these together and uh, as a starting point of our conversation. Well, um, this is something that uh, I think Cara really tells something about fashion today, about like the attitude of the magazine that I, where I work. I mean, we want to be kind of a little bit uh, provocative. We look at fashion as a way uh, to express your personality. Fashion is something that uh, does, it's not there to make you look necessarily sexy to make you look like uh, um, just beautiful it's just something that makes you it, that is there to make you feel better to make you feel um, somehow uh, inspire comfortable with yourself um, that's one of the reasons I do like so much what Leandra does I'm actually starting from the name of her um, of, 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 of what she does, uh, the man repellent. Right. Well, I think what's so wonderful about this series and specifically the Cara video is first and foremost that it's, it's so raw. She's wearing a bathing suit with, with a big t-shirt over it and she's picking at her nose and fidgeting and she's such an emblem of high fashion of today and that's, that's something that W doesn't quite, doesn't necessarily just understand but helps to create and uh, her her demeanor is just so approachable, and, and she, she portrays this, this very aspirational and yet achievable sense of self-confidence and comfort and humor, and up until very recently, it almost seems as though humor hasn't been acceptable within fashion. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to look at fashion not too seriously. I mean, I think to keep uh, a sense of, of humor and really to take fashion for what it is, something that should make our lives better, and should make us you know, happier. That's why you know, we dress up every morning and we look in the mirror and we try to make ourselves happy, not the opposite. Um, that's why I picked Cara just as like a, an example of uh, the person that I would like to reach with the magazine, uh, my ideal reader somehow, and that uh, um, girl, that guy out there on, we, that is, is, is looking for kind of uh, guidance, guidance for kind of support, for understanding when it's making like fashion choices. I really like this idea of an ideal reader. Who would you say is the ideal W girl, if not Kara, just the, the character traits that define 
your readers? Well, I mean, um, I always think that our readers are risk takers. They would not pick up the magazine if they would not like to take a risk. Um, the covers are always something, you know, a little bit uh, provocative. I think, think about, you know, uh, Miley Cyrus in bed, completely naked, but it was not naked because uh, she wants to show off or because uh, she wants to call, you know, a boyfriend in bed. It was naked because she felt comfortable. She was actually covering jewelry. That is not the most comfortable way to be in bed, but she, she, clearly she felt like that the way she wanted to be. She looked at jewelry, even when you're naked, as a way to express yourself. That well, I think and it's those photos specifically were also quite artful. They were nudity with purpose. It wasn't, I mean, we certainly weren't looking at Playboy. No, that's like the kind of uh, idea that I have. So a, a, a woman or a guy that is ready to take some risks and that um, wants to be the first. I mean, our readers want to be the first to, um, know about like fashion, to about news, but also to know about Hollywood, to know about art. And I think uh, our readers, our, you know, um, the people that go to our website, the people that follow our kind of Instagrams and Twitter and like what my, my, my editors do every day, um, are people that want to look at fashion in the context of a contemporary culture. They don't look at fashion as, oh my God, that pair of shoes, oh my God, that bracelet. It's not just about acquiring, I think it's about understanding and uh, putting that knowledge in the context of what is happening around him or around her. You know, it's like a great art exhibition, the work of an artist, or maybe a great movie, or something that is inspiring. I think uh, I look at our readers as inspired people. Right. I think what's also interesting and possibly something that not everyone quite understands is that there's a big difference between shopping and fashion. Just because you like to shop doesn't quite mean that you're interested in fashion. You could be interested in the fashions, but you're not necessarily interested in fashion as, as an art, as a collective, as an entity. And I think W probably speaks to that distinction. Yeah, I mean, it's not that our readers don't shop. I never would say that. I don't think um, anyone in fashion doesn't actually, shop either. But, but the point is that the, the, the first and most important uh, uh, moment is the inspirational moment. I mean, our pages and when what I do in my job and what um, with all my staff we try to communicate, it's really like we try to inspire people to present a lot of different ways to understand reality, to look at how we dress, how we behave, and really like um, show an ac acceptance for a lot of these f different personal approaches. You, if you are familiar with the magazine, you know, we present like stories that tell uh, very different uh, personalities. I mean, we have, uh, you know, stories that are very kind of uh, modern and aggressive. We have stories that are very nostalgic. We have stories that are very romantic. We have like a couple story. It's never just one kind of uh, point of view. It's a, a multiple personality. I mean, sometimes I think, you know, Actually, W has a, a multiple personality disorder. I mean, I called like uh, what we did in this March issue uh, going to a cineplex, like where you have all these choices. And I think that's very much what fashion is today. It's like every day a multiple, uh, it, it gives you so many choices, and not one rule. What you have to be um, ready to do is to accept yourself and make your choices and show your personality. Right. Well, what's really interesting about what you're saying is that it sort of touches upon the concept of trends. And there's this argument that trends no longer exist in this era of uh, essentially so many choices. Do you have any opinions about that? Um, I think that uh, there are not diktat anymore. I mean, it used to be like... Uh, you know, it's about like the short, the, sh the short skirt, or like the long skirt, or the big coat, or like um, something very specific. Today, I think, at least for our readers and for our people, it's about the mood. It's about in, in, I mean, I'm in the mood for what? 
like you know we were just together we were in the mood for denim (laughs) that and and it's something that uh, comes from more sources than actually the uh, brain the mind of of a designer i mean designers leave this kind of very open kind of uh, cultural environment and they get inspired like we get inspired That's actually a very interesting point. We also have access to these designers in a way we never did, so we're able to see a little bit more of their thought process. It's very interesting what you say, because uh, recently we started something that actually you can do yourself on our website that is called Mood Boards. Um, So we ask designers to create their mood boards. Um, And what we find out is that very few of them (laughs) come out with uh, uh, clothes or they come up with trends or something. It's really sometimes it's a piece of stone, sometimes a, an exhibition in a gallery, sometimes it's a piece of a movie. Um, the most uh, incredible like uh, sources and the m- most unexpected. So that's how we all now collect, I would say, ideas and uh, we come up with, with, with moods and I believe there are not trends, they are not dictated, but there are moods, and you should always be in the right mood. I think speaking of mood boards, I'm sure there are many ripouts from W Magazine on plenty of those boards. So why don't we segue over into the fashion photography and take a look at that suspension and disbelief video? Well, um, Thank you for calling this. This is a a, a fragment uh, from uh, a project that uh, we uh, created with uh, Tim Walker. Tim Walker is a fantastic uh, photographer that uh, actually uh, started, um, I I found out recently, working with uh, Richard Avedon. I was just like uh, interviewing Donatella Versace and she was telling me how Tim Walker was on the set of some of the most famous like advertising for Gianni Versace. Um, Tim created like uh, a, a series of portfolio for W that are very special, very imaginative. He usually uses like uh, muses. I mean, uh, Tilda Swinton has been like in three of these portfolios. Some of those portfolios brought us great recognition also from the um, Association of Magazine. Um, this one in particular, I, I, I really love it because it's not, it's, I think it's really about beauty, but it's not necessarily about you know, a beautiful model. It's not just about the clothes. I mean, you kind of have a, 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 a little bit of a perception of the clothes, but it's really not about shopping for the clothes. But somehow everybody wants to get into that mood, wants to understand a certain kind of romantic, uh, a certain romanticism that was very much what the uh, couture season was um, two seasons ago when this was created. So he gave his interpretation of the mood of the moment. We like to give uh, to the photographers kind of a direction and then let them run and create their own kind of universe and tell stories. Um, I think W is about storytelling. That's what probably makes the difference between our fashion photography and any other magazine out there. What is great in this video is that the portfolio that was printed in the magazine becomes some kind of uh, a short movie, you know, it becomes something in movement. It makes the best of what could be a digital edition of W that is not just simple pages, but it's really about sound and movement, and that's what you saw. Can you speak a little bit about the evolution of a story, about how from the point of inception until it hits the magazine, what that looks like? Well, I would like to say that it is a very kind of uh, logical process, but mostly it's not. (laughs) Um, There is really a lot of uh, space for uh, improvisation somehow. Um, We always start after the uh, fashion shows to have meetings, especially with my uh, fashion and style director, Edward Enninful, that is really the genius behind the images in W. And uh, with my editors, my art director, um, Johann Svensson, and all the 
fashion editors. So we, 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 we highlight what, what are the moods, what are the ideas that we want to portray. And we put like this idea in the context of, I would say, what's happening around us, especially in culture. We get inspired by movies, we get inspired by um, exhibition in galleries and the work of artists, and we put a photographer on it. We put an idea with a photographer. That's usually the process. Then um, a lot of things can happen. You know, we pick a model and we have an idea of who that woman should be, but then she's not available. Uh, the photographer has a completely different opinion of where the story should be, or we want to be really like on, uh, you know, go to some exotic location, but the budget doesn't let it happen. Uh, a lot of things can happen along the way. But at the end, I would say every story that we publish usually represents a moment in time and a very specific moment in contemporary culture. I see a lot of the stories, you know, with the, you know, the, the uh, how to say, with thing, looking back and we just published a, a, a book called W Stories. Um, each story tells something about a specific moment in time. That's very interesting. So, I would like to talk a little bit more about this concept of storytelling through imagery because my my personal relationship with storytelling is very much through words. You know, I, I can connect with a photo, but for me it has always been about the art of the written world at word. I've always you know, been so in love with words and have, you know, all these favorite authors and this this feeling that comes over me when I'm able to construct a perfect sentence. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about about the power tethered. You know, they say that pictures are worth a thousand words. I'd love to hear a little bit about that power. And well, as you know, as we can see, more and more like uh, young people are communicating through images more than through words. You know, who is more going to describe, you know, what uh, that uh, specific like uh, plate of uh, I don't know, fettuccine <laughs> with ragu is going to taste like. You just send a picture and, you know, you may even uh, smell it somehow. Um, one, day. Uh, one day, probably. <laughs> so uh, at the same time, most of these images are kind of uh, single images and they don't have the power of a narrative. I think it is... Uh, just opposing one image with another that you can tell a story. And that's how you, know, uh, you, you get to a narrative. And in order to do that, there is a lot of work done behind the scene. So it's not something that you improvise. It's something that uh, you really work for a long time. When I go back, going back you know, to you know, Edward Anningful or many of our kind of fashion editors, when they put together a story, they start with like mood boards. They put up a lot of pictures, things that inspire them. Then like they cast a character, like casting a movie somehow. And then uh, they try to find like uh, the team that can get that kind of look. Not only the clothes in most of these kind of story become kind of the costumes in a certain way, the wardrobe for the movie that the photographer and the stylist have in their mind. And when all these kind of stars align, you get a great story. How important is film for W? Well, I think now that we are all getting more uh, into the digital space, I think community communicating through videos is becoming more and more important, I think, also because it, it's really what I think it's so um, part of the digital language. I think when you can add those two levels, the movement and the sound, you really get into kind of another dimension that is, I think, the, the, the best of the digital dimension. That doesn't mean that you cannot uh, tell great story just showing one image next to the other or connecting images and text. You do it very well in your um, blog, if I can call it. But course, I think yes, it's not anymore a of a blog. <laughs> I would say it's it. much more of... of uh, how would you call he it? He said it. Okay. How would you call it? Uh, I, I think if, if I don't own the term blog, 
the wrong people will, and that's, that's when it begins to get a negative connotation. So I'm comfortable with people calling it a blog. If you want to call us an independent publisher, a media conglomerate, <laughs> we'll take it. Well, I mean, that's why I, I, I mean, Leandra took as a great compliment when I said, I mean, we are in the same business, but I really do. I mean, I think uh, at the end, and this is something that um, I, I keep going back, it's about creating quality, and I think what she does as quality and integrity, and it's about creating original content that I think is really what uh, we do with our job. You know, I mean, I call myself a journalist, and I think Leandra is a journalist, because we create original content. We are not just uh, as assembling and channeling and uh, repurposing content that somebody else has created. Well, Stefano actually made a very interesting point when we were speaking yesterday, which is that almost all of us are creating original content now because of Instagram when we're not repurposing content that's unoriginal and it, it's original content and we're writing the captions. I mean, we're essentially all content creators now, which is very interesting. And I think that because this looks like a room full of enterprising young men and women, they would love for me to ask you what it takes to get a job in fashion. Ha. <laughs> Am I right? Um, on yeah. what, on no, what side not. of fashion? <laughs> let's, say, um, let's say publishing, because that's well, this in side. Publishing, I mean, I think, uh, as, as you know, and as you are showing, you know, everybody can be a publisher. <laughs> Everyone is uh, a publisher. You can t exactly. But um, I, I come from a very traditional background because uh, I started my career really like uh, writing and cutting and piecing images that the way I grew up, you know, that was, uh, yeah, almost like uh, 40 years ago. I mean, and uh, I had my first magazine when I was in uh, my, not before college, in high school, I was 15. And uh, I remember, you know, kind of collecting images and cutting and piecing and going to the printer and distributing and trying to find the founding for it. So it was really like a first-hand experience. So how you learn, you learn making mistakes, uh, paying for them, <laughs> and uh, step by step. You also uh, learn working with talented people. I mean, I never, I, I think we should never under estimate experience. I think uh, there is really something special in working with talented people. I mean, I learned so much from all the editor-in-chief I've worked with, I've worked for, I've learned so much from all the photographers I've worked with. So that's really like to have sometimes also the humility to kind of step back. I mean, I remember, I mean, going back to my experience, I had my own magazine twice, and they were kind of successful enterprises. But at a certain point, I really want to play in the big field. You know, I could have been a very successful uh, editor of a very small magazine in Florence, Italy, but I decided to take a job and as, a, as an assistant at Italian Vogue. Sure, was Italian Vogue, and I had the chance to work with the best photographers in the world, you know, from Peter Lindbergh to even like uh, Irving Penn. That was incredible. So I think sometimes you have to take that, that, that step back and, uh, you know, kind of uh, learn from who has done it before. So I think uh, it's a combination of taking risks but also learning from experience. And, and suspending your ego. Well, that always useful. <laughs> I would say keep it under control. Right. That's, that is very good advice. When a resume, well, maybe I shouldn't ask it like that, but what do you, locating talent is quite hard. Do you have any specific tricks to find it? Or what do you look for specifically when you're hiring? Huh. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I look usually for um, a combination of, again, like um, 
independence and uh, I think uh, somebody that likes to take a, a, a challenge and that has ideas and opinions, but also somebody that is ready to do, you know, kind of uh, the job and pull up the sleeves and do whatever has to be done. So it's kind of uh, um, somebody that is imaginative and uh, somebody that is ready to do the job. Before we open the floor to questions, do you want to talk a little bit about Instagram and the importance yeah, of Yeah, why don't we look at some yeah. of our Instagram feed and we can talk about uh, what Instagram is doing to us. These are some uh, of the images that uh, uh, our editors at W and also a lot of our, our collaborators are feeding as with every day. They come from the streets, they come from interesting places in the world. They are sometimes images that are created just for us. Sometimes they're images that uh, are somehow found or like uh, something that inspire the people around us. As you can see, this is like a, a backstage at Moschino, I think, and before, this is like an, oh, an old cover of uh, W Magazine. It's another like uh, backstage image. Some of these images are just like uh, a way to create content daily in a very imaginative way. One of my favorite W photos that I pulled from the Instagram is the one of Michael Keaton that Tim Walker shot in the yes. yellow suit. Yes, I yes, love that yes. picture. That's great. And these well, are it is also a way to um, kind of communicate in a different way our content and to share it in a different way than on the print page. Yeah. Clearly, you know, the subjects that are more successful on Instagram, but in all social media, and you can tell me if that's true, are a little bit always the same. It's celebrities. Right. It is, um, I would say, getting laid. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of that. Um, what else would, would you put on the list? Hungry. <laughs> <laughs> lots of fashion, lots of accessories shots, shoes and bags. Yeah, and then what I call uh, the essence of American living, eating and losing weight. It's, it's overeating and then overexercising and then overeating and then overexercising. My mom has this, has this theory, she is not American, that Americans' lo biggest flaw, hands down, is that they don't understand the concept of moderation. There is just no such thing All for consequences. Yeah, or con <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, social media, I think it is really like uh, um, something that um, magazines are relating more and more. And I think uh, we create actually more content through social media in a day than in what we can publish in a magazine every month. When did you realize that establishing a very firm social media presence was important, maybe even inescapable, inevitable? Um, I think when actually my editors started like being more obsessed about what they were posting than what was in the magazine, somehow, I mean, I think about, you know, um, Edward Anninfold that has an incredible like uh, Instagram feed, but every single fashion editor in my staff, they are so obsessed about, you know, like putting the right image and representing themselves. I mean, what social media actually has done has become a little bit like the clothes you wear. It's like the image that you want to give of yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a way to represent yourself. Clearly, you know, the selfie is the biggest example of that. But I think it goes down to really like the picture of the food that you are eating or the book that you are reading or the things that you like. It's kind of uh, putting out there a portrait of yourself. And right. that's, I think, uh, it's why I think social media, Instagram, all these uh, uh, different uh, um, way of communicating have, becoming, have become so popular somehow. And also why they are so close to the essence of fashion. When I think about fashion, I always think about a way of 
representing, presenting, introducing myself. It's like the image that I want to give of myself. We used to do it every day, you know, deciding what we wear, what kind of makeup you put mm -hmm. on, what kind right. of lipstick. Now it's about also, you know, what kind of pictures I'm going to put out there, what is on my Facebook page yeah. somehow. It's also kind of the great leveler. It's, it's interesting in that it seems, do you think that it's democratized fashion at all? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I would agree with you. I think uh, uh, it's much easier to put uh, up a picture of a $3,000 pair of shoes than to actually own them. Right, and you still feel like you own them because you're identifying that you see them, exactly. that you like <laughs> them, that you, you have the style, you just don't have the chops, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, our readers do have usually the money to buy them too. That's something nice about uh, W and our readers. I mean, uh, the fact that they do understand quality, they do understand like uh, what is out there and they have also kind of the education and the um, means to accomplish it. And usually it's their own money. It's not just like, it's like they decide every day how they want to uh, express themselves. Mm -hmm. That's in I think back in terms of Instagram, it's also become a very interesting resource to locate creativity and talent. Yeah. Have you been able to find any We have found some uh, very, very good like uh, street photographers that That's have great. been sending us great images. I mean, some of the pictures that you saw in that Instagram feed, actually, they come from them and there are people that you know we we they send us images we use them and then we commission them and uh, we are very happy with what they do i i really love the idea of creating original content i i, I go back there because it's about quality it's about originality it's about uh, um finding a way to um express yourself and create a lot of, uh, uh, of, of things that have a value. Mm -hmm. Are you active on social media? I'm not. <laughs> I have to, uh, I'm, I'm too shy somehow. I, I think I, I would question if uh, um, I can find the right voice. Your in real life force is just too much <laughs> for the internet. That's the truth. Should we change tracks and look at shooting stars? Sure, this is something that uh, we did in Los Angeles and uh, if any of you has a chance to be in LA before the end of the month, uh, this is an exhibition of uh, the best uh, of uh, W celebrity photography. Again, you know, celebrities are commodities. You know, we have pictures everywhere, every day of celebrity in every state of kind of dressing and undressing. That's how close they are to us. But for W, they usually, they take risks, they transform themselves, and we have been able to get out of them something that I would say no other magazine has done before. <laughs> the exhibition is very fun because again, it brings like to life what the magazine is. I think it's very important for every magazine at this point to have a life that is beyond like the paper, even if I like to collect magazine and I could not not show up with one that is print on paper. <laughs> the cover is really something. So everyone should pick up a March issue. Um, let's, l why don't we open up the floor to questions? Hi, I'm Tova. I'm a big fan of the W Magazine. Um, I just wanted to know, like, your career, you're so successful. I'm sure it was a very long path. Has there, any, has there ever been a point along the way where you wanted to give up because it wasn't working out? And what, did you, what inspired you to continue? Um, I think the people I work with inspire me. I mean, uh, I, you know, I have my up and downs, and I think I have fantastic people I collaborate with and they really pull me up so many times. So I think uh, the people you work with are really important. Um, there have been moments uh, in the past when I've done different things than editing a magazine. Um, I'm happy that I did those experiences. I was uh, 
the creative director for J. Crew for a few years, and it was a very interesting experience. But I was very happy to go back and be a journalist at Esquire. I just want to start by saying thank you for creating this wonderful magazine that has been an escape for me. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think is going to, what's going to take to propel fashion forward? Because I'm kind of sick of seeing like stylists always channeling Marilyn Monroe or Audrey Hepburn. Like, what do you think it's going to take for people to really embrace the future and where we're going in technology? Um. I think big changes come especially through technology, you said it. I mean, um, I think uh, the influence of, uh, um, you know, what we live in, like the digital revolution we live in, I mean, is really like what is going to change our way, in, our way of thinking and relating to each other. Um, to say that uh, every, you know, we, we, we live in a time, we live in a postmodern society, in a postmodern culture, it's all about referencing. Uh, at the same time, w nothing is exactly the way it was, it's the, because the contest changed continuously. So yes, designers are redoing the 60s, are redoing the 70s, are redoing the 90s, depends what decade is they're in the mood for. But at the same time, it's never exactly the same pair of pants or the same kind of shirt. Um, the context change, and that's what, uh, where the newness is. I mean, it is in the relationship of things with each other somehow. We're also much more aware of the sausage making. We see much more um, of what's out there and what's being shot and how it's being shot. And so things tend to look the same, but fundamentally, the, the the sort of big changes that we were able to see in the 80s or 90s, we aren't quite grasping today because it's it's like we're growing up with these brands. You know, when you when you have a brother and you you share a room and you see him every day and he loses 20 pounds over the course of six months, you don't quite realize it until six months in when you're like, whoa, you're a different guy. Does that make sense? Fat brother, that's fashion. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Stifo, Stefano. Uh, my name is Emmy Acciotti. I'm a model, <laughs> but I really admire your work. And I wanted to ask, how much is your magazine influenced by Vogue and other uh, Hopper's Bazaar magazine and other influences that you've been uh, exposed to? Um, I would like to answer that we inspire them all. <laughs> Because we usually do it first, um, you know. We are, you know, we we are the ones that you know put every big star on the. I mean, we had Jennifer Lawrence on our cover before anybody else. We had Jessica Chastain on our cover before. Him. I had like Kim Kardashian on the cover before anybody else, and I paid hard for it. Um, but I still love that cover. That was uh, still one of my favorite covers because I still think about that as Barbara Kruger's cover more than Kim Kardashian cover. I thought it was a specific moment. So um, I really, you know, answering your question, I really don't look at uh, other magazines. Um, hopefully other magazines are looking at what we do. Um, you know, each one has, each one of the magazines have a great respect for the editors of the magazines that you just uh, called. Um, but each magazine has an audience and serves a, an audience. So you, sure, you bring, as an editor-in-chief, you bring a lot of what you have inside, but you also are working for a specific magazine that has a specific space in you know in the mind of people so what we create is created for the w audience right. i think that probably inspiration is the wrong word competition is healthy but you should probably never be inspired by anyone in your space um I would say try to be as creative, unique, original as possible. Don't model your career after anyone else's because that person already exists. And that, that's, that's all I got. I don't know. I'm 26. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bianca. Um, I feel like fashion is in a very special time in that it's more celebrity-centered than anything, um, than any other time. So how does WMAG ensure that 
uh, you feature celebrities while your magazine is not centered around the idea of celebrity? Um, as we showed a little bit with like these... Uh, exhibition and that's actually the reason why I want this exhibition in Los Angeles between the Golden Globes and the Oscar uh, is like to demonstrate that uh, we kind of make the celebrity work for us and for the magazine and we don't work for them. Sure there is a synergy between what they are doing at that specific time, promoting a movie, promoting a product, uh, and what we want to accomplish, put on the cover somebody that is in the mind of people, that is going to be in the movie theater around the corner. But we ask them to do something special, something different. We don't replicate their kind of uh, press image. We sometimes really transform them. Sometimes we go to the extreme, and uh, I paid a prize for that too, of making them not recognizable. <laughs> um, but it is a game, you know, uh, one of my favorite covers that I created was uh, Kristen Stewart. The Kristen Stewart had always this kind of look of like, you know, a tomboy and, you know, the leather jacket and the, sh the hair slicked back. And what we did, we, we transformed her in a kind of a Brigitte Bardot, like big hair, like eyeliner, very feminine, in a little soft, uh, I think was a pink sweater. I mean, it was kind of something. We try to go against the grain of what the celebrity is known for. So it's about, you know, kind of making them play a role. And that's actually is also a secret. If you want to get something very special out of a celebrity, give them a role to play. Okay, well, <laughs> sorry, that was my cue. Ha. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Stefano, for shedding all your wisdom. Thank you so much for your very thoughtful questions and for being here tonight.